I want to start by saying thank you for uh, for having me here tonight. Uh, as Pastor David had mentioned, we, we talked, of, I guess it's almost two years ago now, uh, when we sit down, and he actually bought my, my dinner that day, uh, or lunch that day, and I appreciate it. I uh, hadn't carried him yet. But uh, and you mentioned that I was a preaching sheriff. Uh, up the road, we had a singing sheriff. It didn't work too well for him, but I hope that. Uh, uh, but I don't know about the preaching part. But I'll get up here and tell uh, tell a little bit about what goes on in my life, uh, or has went on in my life. I have a couple of questions before we get started. What's your purpose? And the second, do you have the perseverance and the patience to execute your purpose? And uh, I couldn't help my wife. She She's the one, she does a lot of good for me. But uh, she pointed this out, I had no idea. But uh, pro proclaim the good news to all people. That would be a good place to start. Uh, executing your purpose. Because Jesus, He told us to love one another. Love one another. Love your neighbor as I have loved you. And uh, I'm going to start with some scripture out of, uh, out of James. And this is another thing. He told me it was when we met, uh, he wanted me to come and share my testimony one day. And uh, I told him I'd be glad to do that. It's uh, James chapter 1, 2 through 6. It says, My brother, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally and unbraideth not. And it shall be given him. And it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering for the wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Alright, I'm going to slide on over here to, uh, to Romans Chapter 5. It says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So I read these, uh, these scriptures right here. Uh, do you have the patience and the perseverance to execute your purpose? Um, you know, we all have a testimony, and, and uh, does everybody have a testimony? Everybody has a testimony. That's why I'm, a, I'm allowed to get up here and, and speak. And I tell you, the uh, if God had given my testimony to other people with more talents and gifts and all, they could really tell a great story. But He chose me for this testimony. Some testimonies are more powerful than others, and you know, a lot of folks, they want that powerful testimony, but they don't want the test. Right. They go along with it. Right. And, uh, it. and the test is where the action's at. I mean, it's, uh, it's where you're tried and tested. That's why it's a testimony. And it's amazing what comes out of the test in life, the storms in our lives. It's amazing what will come out of them. What we gain in these storms of life is knowledge. And knowledge is powerful. Uh, Jesus Christ, He sits, you know, He sits on a, a throne of authority, and He empowers us to go out and, and speak with that authority if we take and use the knowledge that He's given us. And uh, I think that's the most effective way that we can that we can reach folks that's going through uh, a difficult difficult time or a storm in their life is is by sharing the experiences and the storms that we went through. And uh, you know, life it's kind of like a I guess. Uh, like a heart monitor. It's just up and down, up and down throughout your life. Some people have those great spikes in their life, just tragic. And, uh, you know, which I was just a little baby when, when, once I get into my testimony in just a minute, when it happened to my family. But it was, uh, I mean, the needle pegged out. But we need to use what God has, uh, has given us to, to help one another. So, uh, I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony. And I'm always, if, you, if you've ever heard me speak, uh, which you probably wouldn't come back, but uh, but if you did, you may hear something just a little bit different. Uh, it started in June of 1977. Uh, I was just a little bitty fellow. I wasn't quite three years old yet. And uh, my dad, he was incarcerated in the Murray County Jail. 
And uh, it was a Sunday, and my family, they went to see my dad. And I was supposed to go there that day, and uh, but they said I was cranky and all. So my aunt, my mother's sister, she said, I'll keep Bucky Lee here at the house and put him down for a nap, and I'll have Sunday dinner waiting on you when you get back. So my mother, my grandmother, uh, and three uncles, they went to visit my dad. Well, they went, and there was a, uh, there was a runaway juvenile that uh, I think he had suicidal thoughts and things, and so they had him in a padded cell. And, uh, you know, the Murray County Jail is very small. It's the old, it's the archive building that we have now on uh, E6. But uh, uh, folks could go in and out as they wanted to. And somebody had passed this runaway juvenile a cigarette that day, is what I'm told. And uh, this padded cell, they're supposed to be non-flammable. Well, anyway, he says that he, he holds this uh, cigarette to this padded cell when it starts to kind of smolder. It never really just what you get in the flames or what have you. But, uh, but anyway, it started to fill his, uh, his cell with smoke. And uh, I'm told that, you know, the, the guards, they came, uh, which it may have only been one or two there that day. I'm not sure. But uh, the guard came. He opened the, uh, the door. And when that oxygen hit that uh, padded room, it just... They said it, it just instantly, almost instantly filled the rest of the jail. It just poured out. So folks started running out, and uh, uh, it filled up with smoke. The keys were, were lost or uh, kicked down the hall, something like that. So it was 42 people that died that day. Uh, my parents, well, my daddy, he was incarcerated, my mother, my grandmother, and three uncles. And uh, it was all on my mother's side of the family. Well... That will change your family. And uh, my aunt, uh, which her name was Carolyn, uh, she now became a single mom. She had four kids of her own. Her husband was one of the uncles. Uh, he was the only one that wasn't blood related to me. But her husband, he died in that uh, jail fire that day as well. So she had four grown kids uh, and she got custody of me. Didn't adopt me, just got custody of me and raised me. But uh, she was a very heavy lady. And, uh, but I tell you, she, she taught me a strong work ethic. Uh, she went to work every day. She milked cows. I grew up on a dairy farm. And uh, if you're very heavy or if you're very light, you stand on concrete 10 or 12 hours a day, your feet and ankles and, and all, they're going to kill you. And she went to work every day for 10 or 12 hours milking cows. And uh, she never complained about it. And I tell you, we didn't have a whole lot growing up when it comes to things. But... She loved us. But I'll tell you this. Now, you got to remember, I talked about how these folks were related to me. That was her husband, her mother, her sister, two brothers, and a brother-in-law. That can make you hard. Uh, I was probably 13 years old before she ever told me she loved me. Uh, we were, I don't know, remember what the occasion was, but I'd always tell her I loved her, you know, every time, every day. Uh, but I was going somewhere or something, and, and I told her, I said, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I just kept on and on, five or six, seven times. And finally she, well, I love you. <laughs> and I tell you, it, it's, it's kind of comical, but it was like a wall broke down that day in my mother's life. Because, uh, of course, her grandchildren, they came uh, shortly, well, about that time, her first grandchild was, was born. And... Uh, it was walls started breaking down, and, and she, I think she had a joyful end to her life. Uh, and I lost her about eight years ago. Uh, but anyway, she, if she didn't teach me anything else, she taught me a strong work ethic. She never went to church with me. She always encouraged me to go to church. But I thank God that, uh, that, that she took and she reached out to somebody, and she, she knew that her heart was right with the Lord uh, before she left this earth. So I, I thank God for that. Now, I'm going to back up one second. My wife, she hates when I do this. Can you, I've had positive and I've had negative influences in my life. That was a positive influence. The negative influences, can you get any good out of it? I'm, gonna, I'm asking everybody, but our young people, can you get something positive from a negative? You can, if you choose to. And, uh, and I took... I had plenty of negative influences as well. Uh, and I'm going to get into some of those right now. I had five brothers and first cousins. And they have literally 
spent more of their adult life either in a county jail or a state penitentiary over drugs. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about what I do. Uh, I was the baby of the whole bunch, and uh, the six, well, the five brothers and first cousins, uh, they, they took and they wanted to make excuses for their actions, you know, well, we lost our family, so that's why we, we started smoking weed. Uh, that's what they call it now, is weed. It used to be marijuana, and that's why we started smoking marijuana. But uh, that's where it started, and then, uh, and then they started to support that habit. They started breaking in people's houses. Keith Baker, he sat here, and his daddy probably helped one of my brothers as much as anybody, but he broke in his house, stole from him. And that's what they'll do. They'll take and steal and uh, borrow and beg from the people they love them the most. They stole from my mother until I was big enough to stop it. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, one of my brothers, Ray, uh, he, he was taken. He was probably, I don't know how old he was when he, uh, when he started smoking marijuana and all, but... Uh, Young people, can you trust? Uh, can you trust your friends? Can you trust your friends 100%? No. Just think about it. Can you trust your family 100%? We'll find out. Uh, Ray, he he goes over to our cousins, which they're like brothers, Ricky and Randy, and uh, they they're smoking marijuana together. And he, they, Ricky and Randy, the two brothers, they thought it'd be funny. I hope I don't lose folks. I mean, it's complicated. But uh, they go over to uh, Ricky and Randy, and they thought it'd be funny, and they, they take and, and lace his uh, joint uh, with some angel dust. And they thought it'd be funny, because, you know, see what it would do to him. Well, they did that, and he's had suicidal thoughts about every 18 months or so ever since then. Uh, he, just, he just takes and flips out. And he's not been stable at all. Uh, since he's ten, eight, teenage years, and he's about uh, six years older than me. Brian, you probably went to school with him and uh, was a great artist. He could draw anything. Uh, all my brothers and cousins that I'm talking about, they were all way more talented than I am. I'm the least talented of all these people that I'm talking about. That's what God does. He uses the least of you to get, uh, to get his message across. He'll use any of us. But, uh, but anyway, they, they thought it would be funny. So Ray, he, he's, uh, he's introduced to this, and he trips out about eight or 18 months or so. He'll come into the county jail. He is known as Crazy Ray, and uh, he gets the name on us. He'll come in, and uh, he'll have that jail so torn up that, uh, I mean, he comes in, starts all this racial stuff and everything. He does it as a game. He does it to be put by himself because he doesn't want to be out of population with everybody else. But lucky... Uh, for Ray, we pray for him, I, and I love all my brothers and cousins. And we pray for him, but uh, he's been about as stable as he's ever been the last five years. So I thank God for that. I have another brother that uh, we're actually half brothers. Uh, John uh, is his name. He uh, we call him Bubba, and you've probably been a victim of him uh, because this is your blessing. You you probably met this guy. Hey. Ma'am, sir, uh, have you got $20? My, my daddy, my sister, whoever he picks is in Kentucky and they're on their deathbed and my fan belt broke, my alternator's out, something, and people are giving $40 every time. Well, that's your blessing. You did it for the right reason. Now, he'll be judged for that, but uh, he, is, uh, he can pray the prettiest prayer and he's a great speaker. He was. He was, uh, he was busted in Texas. This is why I worked interdiction. I used to, I was a narco narcotics officer and worked a, a canine, a narcotics dog for seven years before I ran for sheriff. But uh, I worked interdiction. But he was he was stopped by an interdiction agent uh, officer down in Texas. Had 97 pounds of marijuana in his trunk. Well, he was sentenced. He uh, he was given seven years. He did four years. Got out on uh, parole. He was out just a few months. He, uh, he violates and they send him back. He goes back and does about two years or so and kind of flattens his time. But uh, So if you see kind of a heavy set guy that's giving you this sob story about his mother, brother, sister, daddy, whoever it may be, it's not true. Don't give him any money. That's my brother. But he's at Walmart. And that's the thing. I mean, uh, I love him. And, uh, and I pray for him and I feed him and, and all. But uh, I'm not going to enable him. My favorite 
brother, and boy, you said you were going to hear this, didn't you? See, I didn't have told him my favorite brother. But that's the thing. He was my favorite because he left the house. So I was just a little, little fella. It's James. Uh, everybody loved James. He had a great, he had a great personality. Uh, everybody just wanted to be around him. He was fun. He, he decided when he graduated, he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life, really. So he joined the military, joined the army. Uh, he did his first tour, was doing great, moving up in, uh, in rank and all. And uh, he re-ups. Well, like I say, James, he's kind of the life of the party, so to speak. Well, he didn't, uh, he wasn't making the kind of money he needed to make to support the lifestyle he wanted to, to lead. So he started dealing drugs. And he found out that uh, somebody had narked on him. He shoots and kills the guy. This is my favorite brother. When he left for the military, I'll never forget it. Um, he came back from basic, and he had a high and tight. It wasn't even high and tight. It was just high. I mean, he had it all buzzed off. It, it was serious. But I remember feeling his head, and, uh, you know, I was just a little guy, and uh, prob probably your age. And uh, I'd rub his head, and, and the next day I went and got me a high and tight, my first one. And uh, I'll never forget it, but, but anyway, he, uh, he took and he gave in. And, and, you know, for years I talked, the only, uh, time, the only way I was able to communicate with James was by phone. And I could tell over the years that the system, being in the prison system, it was having its toll on him. He took and uh, he was a fighter. He didn't, he didn't go easy. Now, I don't know what all happened to him in there, uh, but I do know these things. He was in there. Uh, he, he was in a fight, it was, I don't guess he was in there six months, and uh, he was stabbed in his lung and collapsed his lung. Uh, he nearly checked out over that when he got better, uh, and then it was a short time later. He was always in the hole. About the first four to seven years, he was in the hole constantly. It was just every now and again he would get out and be able to place a call to us. But anyway, he takes and uh, he, he kills another guy while he's incarcerated. Well, it was a, he, he didn't get any more time for that because it was self-defense. Uh, he actually, someone had told him that uh, some, a lifer had, uh, it, James was given 47 years, I believe, 42 or 7 years when he was initially convicted. But uh, it was a guy in there that was been in prison for life that had put a hit out on him. So he takes and he puts all these magazines, telephone books. It's amazing what you get in the penitentiary that you don't get in the Murray County Jail. But uh, he takes and puts him some armor on and he's ready for when it happens. So this guy, he sees him and uh, they have whatever they have and, and James stabs the guy, which he stabbed as well. He, I don't know, I don't remember exactly his injuries on that one, but it was both of them. But anyway, he, uh, he finally, believe it or not, I guess he did 20, 26 or 7 years, I believe, and he finally made parole. Well, uh, he gets out and uh, he wants to be a part of our life really bad. And, uh, you know, he tries to do good or appears to be, and uh, which he uh, he struggles. Nobody's wanting to hire a felon that's uh, convicted of murder. So uh, anyway, he, my wife and I, we, we ha have had our girls at this point, but he gets out and he's trying to, to be a part and fit back in. Well, he's out for probably six months or so, maybe not even that long. And uh, I get a call one day, and. Uh, he was incarcerated again. And what he had done, he went into a grocery store and uh, had actually put a, sold a pack of hamburger meat or something. And uh, they, they saw in the store that he picked it up. Well, it's not shoplifted until you exit the store. So he gets out of the store before they realize it. So they call it into the local police and they're looking for him. I don't even know what city it happened in, if it's Nashville or whatever. But anyway, uh, they make a stop. And uh, it's two convicted felons in the truck. That's a big no-no. So they had both violated right there. They also, they found a loaded pistol in the truck. That's another big no-no with the convicted felons. So needless to say, he's back incarcerated and has been for four years or so. So that's where they're at. And then I've mentioned a couple of, of other cousins and all, Rick and Randy. One of them, he made uh, America's Dumbest Criminals twice. Uh, these are... <laughs> yeah. Uh, these are my family. These are my people, yeah. But uh, you got to be proud. But like I say, I love them, but I'm not going to enable them. And I'm wired just a little bit different. Now, those are the negative influences that I've had in my life.
And remember what I asked you earlier, can a negative be a positive? Yeah. Absolutely. I saw everything that I didn't need to do in my life. Right. Now some of it, I, I actually did some of it. But I learned from it. God put conviction on my heart at an early age. And it goes back to vacation Bible school. I had, uh, here are some of the positives that, uh, that I had in my life. I had a next door neighbor, uh, Elton Sias. He was probably the closest thing to a father that I ever had. And uh, him and his wife, they were great to me. Like I say, my mother, she never went to church. She, she influenced me to go to church and, and always encouraged me. And uh, she gave me money for the offering every Sunday. You know, I guess that was her way of going to church through me. But, uh, but anyway, Helen and I, we got really close. And y'all probably read the story. You know, uh, he used to fill my pool up with gas about every week, but uh, never charged me a dime. But uh, anyway, they, the men that I had in my life, and, and Elton being kind of number one, Ralph Baker was one of them. Let the church roll on. I'll never forget it. Uh, we'd be working in the back patches and back barn or whatever, hands be bleeding and everything else. That man taught me how to work. Let the church roll on. That's what he'd say. Him 70 years old and outwork any one of us. So anyhow, all these men that I had in my life, they had no idea how I looked at them. Uh, so adults, young people, it's always somebody looking at you right. that is, they're going to be like you, whether you're positive or negative, uh, whatever they choose to be, but they're looking at you. But the, the men in my life, they had three things in common. Number one, they were Christians. Number two, they were family men. And number three, they all worked hard. Good. And that, that's the three things that I kind of apply in my life. Uh, that I try to do do well as well as I can be best Christian be as Christ like as I can be be the best husband and father that I can be and work as hard as I can uh, but those men Elton he, he got me into church uh, his wife actually invited me to vacation Bible school and uh, that's why I prayed to receive Christ and like I said now I stayed that baby Christian for years and years if, if there is such a thing and I believe it is because I didn't grow I was at church and, but I just I didn't grow I wasn't pushed uh, to spiritually to grow and uh, part of that's biggest part of that's on me but uh, but I, I went through life and when I messed up I knew that God he put that conviction on my heart and I learned from those mistakes and uh, Jack Taylor, I don't know if many of you know him, but uh, he was the pastor. I grew up in Mount Wesley Nazarene Church. That's where uh, I grew up in church. And my wife, uh, she was down at Santa Fe Baptist Church, and she played the piano since she was a little girl. So when we got married, uh, I decided she was more involved with church, so I was going with her. So I went down there, and I just took up space. But uh, and Brother Jack, he tried and tried to get me to join the church and this, that, and the other, and I just took up space. And so maybe he was trying to push me. But the last sermon that he preached in our in, at San Fe Baptist Church, uh, he called, he didn't call a man, not one of our names, but uh, he said there's four young men sitting in this congregation. Today it's past time you step up. And buddy, you talk about I could have crawled under the pew. But but I I tell you, from that day, from that moment. God started, He stirred something up inside of me. Uh, it wasn't a few weeks later, I rededicated my life, and uh, and I'm, I'm back back and forth all over with my testimony, but i gotta got to put it in these ways. But anyway, it was a few, uh, few weeks later, I rededicated my life, and uh, I hadn't checked up since. I wouldn't pray out loud in front of folks. Well, it wasn't six months. I was a Sunday school superintendent teaching Sunday school class. And I mean, it's amazing what God starts to do and he, how He'll use you when you just turn it over to Him. But uh, uh, I want to talk about the greatest gift that God has ever given me, and that's my wife. Only second to Jesus Christ. And uh, that's the greatest gift that, that He's ever given me, uh, with the exception of His Son. And uh, you can thank her for the King James Version. It's got my name on it and everything. But uh, when I was 19 years old, my wife, she bought me that Bible for Christmas. And uh, I tried to read it. And uh, I didn't understand a lot of it. But see, she was trying to influence me to, to grow. Uh, she, uh, she's been my rock and she's given me 
uh, two beautiful daughters, and uh, they hold me accountable. And I didn't start with the prayer tonight because we've been praying a lot. My, both my daughters on the way over, we actually dropped them off at Grandma and Pop's, but they both prayed for me. My oldest daughter prayed, yeah, it was probably that I wouldn't mess up. So, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, <coughs> Carrie, is, Carrie is definitely the most positive influence that I've had in my, my life. So young people, here's another. Right. If, when you are, uh, when you're looking at these girlfriends and boyfriends, if they're not worth marrying, they're not worth dating. Amen. So good. anyway, uh, but so God was very good to me by giving me a great wife. Good. Uh, now I talked about all of these uh, negative things, and I don't want to keep you, you all too long, but I talked about all these negatives and, and some positives in my life, and you probably uh, probably think, well, poor, pitiful Bucky. Well, don't feel sorry for me, because God has blessed me in more ways than you'll ever know. Uh, I'm not a victim. I choose not to be a victim. Right. We all go through life storms. God has given me the perseverance through those storms to finish what He what He finished years and years and years ago. I mean, He's done. He's taken the test and He won it. But uh, that's what we need. We need to choose to be positive. Uh, I took and once I graduated high school, I, I'm going to back up. I've been all over the place. But I graduated high school. Uh, I went with Plan B. Uh, Carrie kind of got in, in the way of Plan A. Uh, I was going to the military. I was going to do like James. You know, like I say, he was my favorite brother. She asked me not to join, so I didn't join the military out of high school. And uh, I thank God now that I, I didn't, I guess, because, uh, you know, we here we are 20 years later and two beautiful daughters. But uh, I went with Plan B. I started my own uh, excavation business. And uh, after I went out and, and was trained up and started my own business, I was 21 years old when I started. Uh, my business. People thought I was crazy. He'll never make it. Well, I built a successful excavation business. Backhoes, dump trucks, track loads, bulldozers, uh, back, backhoes, uh, pretty much anything you think of. And it was successful, but it wasn't fulfilling. Uh, I loved and was talented uh, with those things. You know, growing up farming, I was good at those things, but it wasn't fulfilling. I felt like something was missing. I told my, I came in one day. I told my wife. I said, "I'm going to sell my my business." She said, "You're crazy." In about what three weeks, I was sold out. Those guys that I was competing against was happy to buy my equipment. So, <laughs> uh, so I sold out. Didn't know what I was going to do. I did a couple of other little things, and uh, I was 29 years old, and uh, I couldn't go to the military or I didn't want to leave my family. So I decided to uh, to get in law enforcement. That was the uh, that was the next uh, that was next in line as far as military goes. I figured that would be serving my community and all, and uh, I wanted to help people. And uh, so I went to Enoch George's house. I showed up. He wasn't there. I talked to uh, talked to his wife, and uh, she gave me some good well some advice. Don't do it. And uh, <laughs> I didn't listen. But Enoch, he. Uh, uh, he called me later that night and said, well, son, if that's what you want to do, well, you just be at the jail at such and such time, and I'll have somebody give you a tour. And uh, I showed up at the jail, and this was the second time I left out of my first time that I ever been into a penal facility. I went to visit James when I was 18. But uh, the second time, uh, there was this lady, she, she meets me out front. She's a sergeant on day shift, and we walk through that door, and there's nothing like the sound of our doors at the Murray County Jail, that big metal door, boom! I mean, it gets your attention when it closes behind you. And I'm gonna tell you, when you've lost your family, it's a weird feeling when you walk behind them, those uh, closed doors and go through those traps. And I know I can't get out, out back outside without somebody letting me out. I didn't like it and it took me a little while to get over that. But anyway, they gave me a tour. Yes, sir, it's what I want to do. Well, he gave me a job, and I started in corrections, and uh, I worked my well I worked in corrections not quite a year, and uh, was promoted to deputy. You know, I came in, did a good job. There was folks did as good or better job than I did. I can assure you of that. But for whatever reason, Enoch decided to, uh, to promote me to deputy, and I I greatly appreciated him. But he promoted me to deputy. I went into the SRO unit. I took and. Uh, 
they, they used to, boy, I hate to, I hate to say this, but it seemed like they put the, the, the guy that didn't fit in anywhere else, they put him over at the alternative school. <laughs> they, they did. Well, I asked to go to the alternative school. I actually asked to go. Because that's the thing, I wanted to, I felt like I had a story to share with, uh, with these kids that was going through a difficult time. So I went over there, I was at the, uh, the SRO at College Hill at the alternative school for about 18 months. And I truly believe and feel like God used me to help change some of those kids' future. Amen. And uh, I gave them some hope. I feel like I did. Uh, they're, they're still doing, some of them are still doing pretty well today. And they've been, went through even more than I have. But that's the thing, they chose not to be a victim. Um, and you would think, well, what is this country bumpkin deputy from Water Valley? How can he help an inner city black kid, Hispanic kid? Inner city white kid, anybody, you know, he's country, he's cornbread. I, my wife, she gets mad at me for saying that. I couldn't have, I said that for you, baby. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, God will use you. But I took and, and those kids, when I looked at them and talked to them, they know that I knew where they were coming from and what they were going through. And that I shared with them what God has done for me. I, I passed on some of that perseverance and that patience, and I loved them because he put them in my path and uh, so anyway uh, after I did that about 18 months or so we uh, I went to patrol and uh, then we started a canine unit so I wanted to be all part of that because I love dogs and love training dogs and I hate drugs so he put me in that role and uh, for, so for seven years I was I was happy and that's where I was would have stayed as long as uh, as long as he would have been there. That's where I would believe I would have stayed. Never tried to move anywhere else. But uh, I knew that that uh, I was going to run for sheriff one day. And people thought, you know, well, oh, okay. They didn't know that it would be as soon as what it was. And uh, when I told when I came out and said I'm running for sheriff this next time, people thought I was crazy. They they made some of them said it to my face, but most of them wouldn't. They were going to making jokes. Well, he doesn't stand a chance. So Bucky, he's a good guy, but he doesn't stand a chance. Well, I never doubted that I was being called Amen. to run for that position, Amen. and uh, and and I didn't. Anybody that talked to me, you know, hey, do you really think you can win? Absolutely. But I never prayed that I would win. I just prayed God's will would be done Good. for this county and in my life. And uh, I waited on my wife. Uh, we, we took and we did what we needed to do as far as we knew what our bills were. They weren't going to change. So we put some money away because uh, I knew I was going to have to resign and all. So I, it was one Sunday and I was out and she called me and she said, it's time. I said, it's time for what? She said, it's time for you to resign. I said, all right. And I never checked up. I used what God had entrusted to me, and that was my youth. That was that strong work ethic and commitment. And I went out and I started knocking on doors. And, and I tell you, it, there was roadblocks that was put up in front of me just continuously. And I'm going to tell you, God was, His hand was all over it. Amen. And I, I hate to tie politics and, and religion and all, no. but I'm going to tell you that we need to get Christ. some religion and some politics. We need to get some Christ and some politics yeah. because that's exactly what gives me chill bumps right now. <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, he, he, uh, his hand was all over it. Every obstacle that I ran into, it ended up better. Those signs that everybody hated, the first ones, well, I got, I got two by twos. Nobody else had two by twos. They had like 12 by 18 or 12 by 20s or something. I'm getting these two by twos with this big old badge and everything. And, and a lady, good friend of mine, she took and, and came up with it. And boy, I love it. And you walk outside and you couldn't read it 10 feet away because the letters was too small. Well, you know, I bought 250 to start with. And... Uh, so anyway, I'm thinking, man, this is just a big waste. And, you know, I was going to spread them out through, all throughout the county. Well, you couldn't read them. Well, everybody knows me in Santa Fe. And I put a few out in Santa Fe. Everybody called wanting a sign. So everybody in Santa Fe got a sign. And that made a statement. When the community that knew me the best, that they stood behind me, I would have never thought, I would have never dumped all of that into one right. spot. I was going to spread it out, you know, because we were just going as it came, you know. Somebody made a donation or what have you. But that was God. I truly believe that. Uh, it's a man sitting in the back and his wife and his kids. Uh, Ray and I, Ray Jeter, 
Pastor Baker knows him very well. I just knew him and Courtney from work in passing. Well, we didn't know one another that well, and uh, they wanted to come over and eat supper one night. It's part of his plan. Ray and I, Ray, he ran for, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of Ray's testimony. He ran for county commission. And you know what? He was out, he was beating the bushes, knocking on doors and everything, just like I was. And we built a relationship. He knew what I stood for. I know what he stands for. We built a relationship. He didn't win his election. He wasn't meant to win his election. He was put, we were put in one another's path because God had a plan for our lives. He's got a testimony. You ought to call him sometime. Uh, but God started working and using us and raised in his early 30s. And I, I had no idea that uh, he'd be my chief deputy. Uh, everybody said I was young. They really thought my chief deputy was too young. But I'm going to tell you, we once we got in there, uh, it took and God started knocking down doors and walls and, and everything else. Uh, since we've taken office, and it's not us, it's just right. us sharing the vision and ideas of helping and loving one another and uh, the, having the perseverance and the patience. Just like Pastor Baker said, you know, hey, these folks, we see the same folks over and over and over again. But that's the thing. As Chief Jesus said, you know, you can lead a horse to water and you can't make him drink, but you got to keep leading him to water. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to keep loving folks. It's on them if they don't, uh, if they don't, if it doesn't take. But we're going to use what God has entrusted to us, and uh, we've been able to do great things in His name. Uh, I'd like to say I don't want to go too long, uh, but God has truly blessed me. I I chose not to uh, to be a victim of it. I chose to use what me and my family have went through. Uh, to, to help others that, that necessarily can't help themselves, but they can if they choose. And uh, so that's the message God has given me, that uh, life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Amen. So, uh, but the greatest, you know, as, as much as bad things as happens to anyone sitting in this room, the greatest injustice in history is crucifixion of right. Jesus Christ. Right. That was one heck of a stone. But it was the most glorifying event the world has ever known. It was Calvary. And Jesus being crucified, laid dead in the tomb, and three days later, He arose alive. That should give you hope. I'm going to close with one, one last bit of Scripture. It's in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, 8-10. through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. We're not saved through anything but through faith, and that's a gift from God. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before, hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's got a plan for your life. Right. You got a purpose. Do you have the patience and the perseverance to see it through? Let me just It's as easy as that right there. Just take it. Right. He got him a 2015 Dodge pickup. Just <laughs> this thing, God, he won't take it back. It's always out there. I'm gonna take the truck back. <laughs> But uh, Pastor Baker, he, he's going to have an uh, invitation in just a minute. The test has been taken. Jesus says it. If you've accepted it, what are you doing with it? If you haven't accepted it, why not? You don't have any hope if you haven't. Right. But thank you all so much, and uh, it's an honor to be here before